Coming up at the end of this month, be sure to catch our two-part special, Canada in the Great War. We focus on the rise of General Sir Arthur Currie. Arthur Currie was as unlikely a candidate for war hero as ever set foot on a parade ground. Physically unfit and a failure in business before the war, citizen soldier Currie, after having commanded no more than 400 men during peacetime, had risen from relative military obscurity to command of the elite fighting machine on the Western Front, the Canadian Corps. And we march alongside Canadian forces as they spearhead the last 100 days of World War I. Unlike many previous battles, there would be no preliminary bombardment until zero hour, 4.20 a.m. August the 8th. More than 900 guns were set to fire at that moment, followed quickly by the advance of nearly 600 tanks and 1,900 aircraft. And waves of infantry would begin the march of the last 100 days. Don't miss Canada in the Great War, January 24th and 31st, only on Point of the Spear. Welcome to Hamilton at War, our 12-part weekly podcast series that brings to life in vivid historical and emotional detail, Alexander Hamilton's Revolutionary War Service. I'm Robert Child, and I hope you enjoy this latest installment. Hamilton at War, written by Robert Child and narrated by James Gillis. Hamilton, now back in Albany, in the Schuyler's study, paced. He was restless, with nothing to do. He went to the window, looked out, and then returned to the room. He wandered over to the bookshelf, and began to read some of the spines. One book caught his interest, The Universal Dictionary of Trade and Commerce. Within days of seeing this book, more books on finance were stacked high around Hamilton at his desk. With his head buried in a commerce journal, he hit upon a revelation. That's it! That's it! He repeated as Eliza entered with a tray of tea. Hamilton was newly energized. Thank you, Betsy. I tell you, dear, I have become convinced that it is by introducing order to our finances, by restoring public credit, not by gaining in battles, that we are finally to gain our objective. If a national bank were established from the resources of our wealthiest citizens, their interests would be tied to the whole and to the success of our new nation. Elizabeth smiled. It is so good to see you so hard at work in less dangerous pursuits. He smiled, and she returned it. A movement through the window attracted Hamilton's attention. He moved to have a look. Outside, in the street, twenty militiamen with guns and packs marched past the Schuyler home toward the river. Hamilton quickly rushed out the front door of the home to the street. You! Militia! Why are you on the march? A man closest to Hamilton responded, We have been called up, sir. Called up? What are your orders? All we was told was to move south to camp with the French army at New Windsor. Hamilton was stunned. The French are at New Windsor? Reckon so, sir. The men continued to march on. Eliza joined Hamilton at the roadside. He turned to her. There must be something in the works. Eliza returned abruptly inside. Hamilton, noting her rapid departure, followed. Dear, I must ascertain if a major action is planned. I must ride to New Windsor. Eliza, her hands clenched together, said, Alexander, you would leave us now when we most need you. She put her hand on her pregnant belly. You court danger simply to win selfish laurels. Hamilton stood silent. Your glory will be but hollow comfort to our newborn and your widow. She began to cry. Hamilton softly said, Dear, I must be a part of it. She ran off mid-sentence and left him standing in the foyer. 
she knew he would not remain in Albany. Colonial Encampment, New Windsor, New York The huge American and French encampment at New Windsor had spread to both sides of the Hudson River. Hamilton arrived on a fine chestnut horse. Trailing his was another grey horse carrying his trunk. He planned to stay a while. The armies appeared indeed to be preparing for a combined action. Soldiers cleaned their guns. He saw other soldiers mending uniforms. The former aide-de-camp rode slowly, his eyes envious of all before him. Friends called to him, and he waved back. But he began to feel alone and distant from it all. He slumped in his saddle and thought to himself, I'm not part of this. I am shamefully idle without command. Deep depression settled over his face as he arrived at the headquarters house of 48-year-old General Benjamin Lincoln. Hamilton tied his horses to a post and entered the home. Lincoln said, Colonel Hamilton. Yes, sir. Sorry to impose, General, but I wish to draft an immediate letter to His Excellency. By all means, Colonel. Use my office. General Lincoln exited with a slight limp. Hamilton sat at the desk, took quill in hand, and began to write. Your Excellency, it pains me more than words can express that I enclose my commission to you in resignation from the Army. Washington's HQ, New Windsor, New York Tench entered Washington's office with a letter from Hamilton. General Knox was in informal conference with Washington. Sir, excuse me, a letter from Colonel Hamilton. Washington's eyes rolled as he commented, Why does he pester me so? Tench smiled and remained. Knox laughed and added, Sir, he does have the gift of tenacity. You have to give him that. Washington reached for the letter. Certainly there must be a post you could find for him, General. Yes, Henry, but he would not be satisfied with a ceremonial command. He seems to believe he should lead troops in the field. Ah, Knox said, that he has kept no secret. Washington opened the letter and began to read, his brow narrowed with concern. Resignation? Tench and Knox looked at one another. Washington read the end of the letter aloud. Since you have not seen fit to award me my due and proper station, it has become plain that no need for my continued service exists in the Continental Army. Washington tossed the letter and Hamilton's commission on the desk. Colonel Tymon, go get Hamilton at once. Knox remained quiet a moment, then spoke. Sir, he must want this field command very badly to offer his resignation. Washington looked to Knox exasperated, then quickly rose to his feet, clenched and unclenched his fists, and shook his head. Does he not see that he belongs at his station in my service? Knox, seeing something of himself in Hamilton, took his opportunity. Sir, many winters ago, a young ambitious commander, anxious to prove manly bearing to advance his station, came to you consumed with a wild idea. He would haul cannon hundreds of miles in the snow to aid our men at Boston. The success of this scheme was by no means assured. Yet you granted me a trust which I had not earned. Has not Colonel Hamilton earned your trust? Washington, silent a moment, sighed, and then slowly nodded his head in agreement. The British Encampment at Portsmouth, Virginia more than 8,000 British soldiers were encamped on the western side of the Elizabeth River in Portsmouth, Virginia. The intense July heat stifled the movement in camp. A young black man carrying strawberries in a basket headed towards the headquarters tent 
a 43-year-old, seasoned, Eton-educated General Charles Lord Cornwallis. James Armistead, carrying the basket, was a 21-year-old spy for American General Lafayette. Within the British headquarters tent, Cornwallis was speaking with five subordinate commanders. General Clinton has indicated his intention to recommence operations here in Virginia very soon. Armistead entered with the strawberries. Cornwallis paused and grabbed one from the basket, then continued, We've been ordered to fortify our base here at Yorktown while he sends naval support. Washington must be prevented from sending any support to his southern campaign. Cornwallis then bit into the strawberry. Oh, James, these are exquisite. Wherever did you find them? I knows where to look, Lord Cornwallis. Excellent. The other commanders moved in to pick from the basket as well. Washington's HQ, New Windsor, New York. Washington paced behind his desk. Two knocks were heard at the door. Come, Washington shouted as Hamilton entered, hat in hand, slightly shaking. Washington motioned the colonel to a chair. Have a seat, colonel. Hamilton saluted quickly and sat quickly. So, colonel, you wish to resign from the cause? I do, sir. There is no longer a place for me here. Washington continued to pace, sizing Hamilton up. Hamilton, you are a stubborn man. Hamilton smiled sadly. In the artillery, your bravery was unquestioned. In my service, you made yourself indispensable. In cultivating our relations with the French army, you have no peer. Now what am I to do with such a valuable man who insists upon leaving us? Hamilton looked up, wondering what Washington's next words would be. No, sir, I shall not accept your resignation on this day. Washington slid the commission on the desk back to Hamilton. I am returning your commission, with the assurance that I shall endeavour by all means available to appoint you to a combat field command at my earliest opportunity. Hamilton was both shocked and speechless. He slowly rose to stand. Sir, I am at a loss to find the proper words. Washington smiled and commented, Perhaps, Colonel Hamilton, for the very first time in your life. Lafayette's headquarters, Malvern Hill, Virginia. On a high bluff overlooking a bend in the James River, inside an ornate gabled manor home, General Lafayette learned the astonishing news from James. You are certain of this, James? Yes, sir. He said the British ships will be here soon. Washington's HQ, New Windsor, New York. Washington, at his desk, with Knox in conference, stopped and read the letter just arrived from Lafayette. My dear General, from the enemy's preparations they are working for the protection of a fleet and for a defense against another. In the present state of affairs, sir, I hope you will come yourself to Virginia. Washington's smile grew as he read further. Lord Cornwallis must be attacked soon, with a pretty great apparatus. When a French fleet takes possession of the bay and rivers, and we form a land force superior to his, his army must soon or late be forced to surrender. And Washington read the end of the letter to General Knox aloud. Adieu, my dear General. I heartily thank you for having ordered me to remain in Virginia, and to your goodness to me I am owing the most beautiful prospect of victory I may ever behold. Washington looked at his artillery commander, and Knox slammed a fist into his palm. Henry, we must go where opportunity lies. I am suspending all plans for an attack upon New York. We march to Yorktown. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Thanks for listening. I'm Robert Child, and be with us next week for another exciting installment of Hamilton at War, only on Point of the Spear. 
Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.